please don't be shy. I do see some names and uh, that I recognize. I mean, you guys have been with us here for at least a few other community development activities, if not for the annual forum. Um, so do please feel free to jump on the chat and just introduce yourselves so that the rest of the um, community, the rest of the attendees and our speakers here today also know who they're working with. Um, and also, this is going to be a interactive workshop, so you do have the options to turn your camera and your microphone on, but we will ask that you keep them off until the portions of, you can keep your cameras on perhaps, but just your microphones off um, throughout the portion of the presentations. And then there will be a lot of interactivity as well that will be happening. Um, okay. Okay, we're gonna give it just about one more minute and then we're gonna get things, we're gonna get started. All right, well, we'll get started. And uh, as more people join us, we'll just add them on as we go. So welcome everyone to Peer Review 101, how to provide unbiased, clear, and constructive feedback to research manuscripts. Um, we are hosting this event in partnership with Peer Review, and we have two incredible speakers who are gonna be joining us today, who are already here with us actually today, Vanessa and Daniela. Um, and they're gonna be walking you through all things Peer Review in just a second. Um, so for the people who have already been here in the past, you know the drill, um, we're just going to run through some quick housekeeping slides and then we'll jump into the actual, um, content related or interactive part of the event. So just some housekeeping, like I mentioned to some of you, this is a meeting format. The goal of this is to increase interactivity for the workshop. Um, that's the biggest across the board, the biggest thing that we always hear back feedback wise that people want more interaction in our events. So I really hope that you will take advantage of it. I've already, I'm sensing that we've got a shy group of people with us, but I really do hope that you push past that and take as much you know advantage of the interactive portion of the event. However, we will just ask that you have your cameras and microphones off during presentations so that we don't distract the speakers um, if you have any questions for the speakers at that point, you can also just put them into the chat um, and then they can always refer back to your questions later. Um, if you feel like any of us are talking too fast, please do just click the raise hand feature um, and that will be the signal for our speakers and myself included um, for us to slow down. And then for the chat, like I mentioned, it is for Q&A, but also if you're having any technical issues, if for example, for some reason, none of you can turn on your cameras and that's why we haven't seen any of you yet. Um, you just pop that into the chat and our technical support joy will um, help you out. And then one other thing is for the polls. So the polls here, it's a bit, the way that it's phrased is a bit um, misleading. So there are gonna be polls in the event and there are gonna be breakout rooms in the event. They are not related to each other. We're gonna have a poll at the beginning of the event um, where you're just gonna answer the question for our team. They will be launching the poll when it's time. Um, and then there will be some breakout rooms where you're really gonna have your chance to get that interactive experience that you've all been asking us for. Um, and then there will be probably one other poll, I believe towards the end. So please, like I said, interaction, interaction, interaction. You won't get the best out of this workshop if you don't engage. Um, yeah, so please, please do uh, take advantage of all of the different features that our lovely uh, host partners have set up for us and for you. All right, next slide. Please. So just some quick, you know, as I said, most, I think many of your names are very familiar. Um, so I know that you've already been here before, um, but just a little bit about the forum. Uh, we are a nonprofit membership organization that support the advancement of open science in the Arab region. We focus on research communities and institutions, and we try to keep it very grassroots. Um, so we're very community oriented. 
Um, and yeah, these are the four pillars that we try to, you know, um, embody within each of our activities and each of our goals. Next slide, please. What we do, so we have three main types of activities that we do. We have the CDAs. So an example of them is what we have, what's happening today, their community development activities. We host workshops, webinars, working groups, um, and symposiums. We're expanding the program every year. Um, we then have resources that we are also working to produce. We've just launched the first ever English Arabic to English, or sorry, English to Arabic glossary of open science terminology. Um, and we're constantly working to produce resources that help advance open science in the Arab world and localize open science policies. And then the last thing is our annual forum, where actually I am currently based in Qatar. I'm on a quick trip here because sneak peek, the annual forum is actually going to be hosted in Qatar this year. Um, and so we're very excited about that. Um, and so we're just scouting some things out at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so without further ado, um, I will be introducing Daniela Sederi. I hope I said your last name right, from pre-review, and she's going to kick us off. Again, please interact, engage. I'm going to start, like, yelling at all of you soon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> please do, please do uh, engage with our speakers as much as possible. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this introduction. Um, participation is optional, but yeah, it is. It would be nice uh, if you want to engage, but also we're going to have ways, different ways for you to um, to engage. So um, hopefully that will become comfortable by um, at least half through 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 the through the, uh, the workshop. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I am uh, a little sick um, and my head is a little foggy. So hopefully that will be an excuse for today for all my mistakes. <laughs> throughout this presentation. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, okay, so you all should be uh, seeing my full screen. Let me, so I'm not gonna be able to um, um, see um, your faces, but it seems like everybody has a camera off, so that, that works. Um, okay, everyone, welcome to um, this um, Open Reviewers Workshop. It is, we have many versions of the Open Reviewer Workshops. It goes all the way from a long 14-week uh, program to um, a six hours workshop, a three-hour workshop. This is our one hour and a half workshop version. So I'm really happy and honored to be here uh, with you all. And I really thank the organizer for inviting, organizers for inviting us um, here. Um, if you wish, uh, just to like, you know, you I know that you have already shared a little bit, but like uh, maybe um you would like to add an emoji or a reaction um uh, to how you're feeling today, and uh, we can we can start breaking the ice that way. Um, and let me see if I can go forward. Why well, can yeah? Here we go. So I'll just say a teeny bit about myself. Um, again, my name is Daniela Saderi. I'm Italian. I grew up in Sardinia, where I'm actually currently uh, staying to visit my family. Uh, but I use uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, in the United States, uh, where I completed a PhD in neuroscience. So I have a, pa a, a past life uh, on the uh, on the bench. Uh, but then I um, kind of fell in love with open scholarship, with the open scholarship movement, and with um, Kind of trying to uh, improve uh, scholarly communication and uh, work with a global community um, that includes you all uh, towards a better um, a better space a better space for researchers to conduct their research and advance knowledge. Uh, so Mozilla gave me this photo down here um, a one year fellowship during my PhD that allowed me to kind of further develop pre review um, together with these two fantastic women Samantha Hindle and Monica Granados. And then well, more recently, we've been joined by um, three other wonderful members of the team. So I feel very lucky, including Vanessa, um, to be working at Pre-Review right now. Um, and I have two children that also keep me um, busy um, in uh, here and in Portland. Why can't I? Okay, here we go. And it's Vanessa, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'll give a very quick introduction to myself as well. So my name is Vanessa Fairhurst. Um, I've worked in um, open science for about the last 10 years, usually in a community engagement role. So I've worked previously at INASP and at Crossref, and now I'm the community manager at Pre-Review. 
Um, however, I, my academic background myself is not actually in science, so I work. Um, my I studied applied and professional ethics, um, and I currently live in Oxford in the UK. Um, and I welcome you to also say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining from. That would be great to see. Um, and I'll pass back to Daniela for now. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa will come back um, after the break. Okay, before we start with the content, no, that's not what I meant. Why am I having trouble moving forward? <laughs> it's odd. Um, we, um, I would like to just go over a few uh, group agreements. Uh, so what we're going to try to do here um, today is to use uh, what's often called Chatham's house rule, which means that we can um, share information and you can uh, share uh, kind of um, anecdotes or uh, quotes from today's uh, meeting, but uh, you're not um, allowed to reveal who made it. So if you if you hear maybe someone that shares a story and you would like to tell it to someone else outside of this workshop, you can, but please do not refer them to the person who uh, said that. Um, and you feel free to eat, stretch, and move. I know that you, you have been to these seminars before, but we are also okay. Um, we know that there is a life going on um, behind those screens. And if you would like to ask questions, please stop us at any time. And you can uh, raise your um, Zoom hand, uh, put it in the chat. The person that is not speaking will be monitoring the chat. And we can um, invite you to unmute if you wish or uh, try to answer it in the chat directly. <coughs> We are going to uh, use a Google Doc um, uh, for the notes today. So there's going to be uh, a chance for you all to interact if you wish uh, to do so by writing on a Google Doc. And they will be anonymous because um, it will be um, just, uh, you know, you'll appear as whatever anonymous animal Google decides to give you at that moment. Um, and then if you uh, want, especially this is true when we enter breakout rooms, um, if you are a person that kind of is very comfortable talking, um, please uh, do pause and allow for other people that may need a little bit more time to just get to that comfort level uh, to engage. And be open and curious about um, other people's opinion and experiences uh, as we are here to learn from one another. Um, we do have a code of conduct that applies to all events hosted by Free Review, our platform, pretty much everything around Free Review. Uh, you can access the code of con the full code of conduct on our website. Um, but here are just some um, uh, kind of uh, tips, some uh, highlights for participants. We want to encourage everyone to use welcoming, inclusive language to provide feedback that is constructive. And this is, we're particularly into constructive feedback for peer review, as we're going to see in the second half of the presentation. Uh, and we want to be respectful again, again of different viewpoints that there is no one truth. We won't allow many truths and many possibilities and many solutions uh, to problems. We want to do that in a respectful, respectful way. Um, and we want to show empathy uh, towards our participants and our fellow uh, community members. If you do experience a violation of the code of conduct or something that makes you even just uncomfortable, perhaps in the breakout rooms where we're not going to be there with you, please feel free to immediately uh, send a direct message to me or Vanessa. Um, and we will try to solve the problem if it's, need if it's needed right there. Or if something that doesn't need immediate uh, reaction, you can uh, email us at report at preview.org or fill up a um, uh, possibly anonymous form. You can leave it anonymous or you can leave your name uh, and we'll um, try to address it. So thank you. Um, okay, so our primary goal today is to facilitate conversations and make space for collective learning that is most likely to lead to transformative change in our practices. However, transformative change takes time and we do not expect that over the course of 90, you know, you're gonna leave this workshop just completely transformed. What we hope is to just provide some uh, starting points, just plant some seeds that you can, um, you know, take with you and maybe like change one thing in your practice and maybe, uh, you know, grow that seed um, on your own, in your own experience. And we also hope to get seeds from you. So uh, if you do feel like sharing, uh, we always learn a lot by engaging um, with um, with you all. And my hope is that by the end of, again, this workshop, you'll have a general understanding of how, gain a general understanding of how system of oppression and what we mean by system of oppression may manifest in the peer review process. Um, you'll have learned uh, some strategy to recognize, self-assess and address personal bias in the context of peer review. Um, and you'll have, you'll have learned a little bit more about our work at Pre-Review and hopefully join in um, 
in uh, join our, our community. Um, if you wish to make any notes during the workshop, there is a collaborative Google Doc that was shared already in the chat, I believe, that you can use. Or so obviously, you have also your own notes. Um, feel free to note whatever it's um, more convenient for you. Uh, just before we um, we start also, um, it, this is the only pre-review slide that we have, except like at the end, we have a video. Uh, but what is pre review? Maybe you, not all of you know us, which is um, makes sense. Um, we are a small uh, but very motivated and passionate organization uh, that operates as a nonprofit. Um, and our mission is to bring more equity and transparency to scholarly peer review. And that includes manuscript reviews that also have been working on grants reviews. Um, and we we want to um, see we envision a world in which participation to uh, to review and feedback is expected in a way that is constructive and um, uh, in a process that is rewarded for uh, who, whoever engaged. And uh, we expect every every researcher, all researchers, and all uh, practitioners to engage um, in this fulfilling process. Uh, so um, the way that we try to kind of um, move towards our um, vision. Um, is by engaging in uh, training, but also like again, this like peer to peer learning, um, in uh, learning how we can be all more socially um, conscious. We call uh, reviewers, kind of reviewers. Um, we also uh, run collaborative review sessions called live reviews, um, where we discuss preprints um, in a Zoom room like this one, and then we collaboratively write constructive feedback and publish it on our platform, which is kind of like the third pillar, but also um, the the reason why there's a, a hat here or the roof is because the platform for us is really the home where we want to see this community grow and the recognition for their contributions to grow. So anyone with an ORCID ID can publish reviews um, on pre-review.org of preprints. Um, and we'll show a little bit more about that at the end of the workshop. Um, okay, so now we would like to launch our first uh, one of two polls that we have in this workshop. And I'll have uh, Vanessa run this. So um, please, Vanessa. So yeah, the question is how many peer, reviewer, peer reviews have you conducted? And that means um, if you've written a review of a manuscript on your own, um, or you know, perhaps someone your your PI um, has engaged in a review. Um, we would like just to to get a sense of who is in the room. Thank you. There is a, a second question as well, um, which is how confident you feel in your ability to identify bias in peer review, which we'll be talking about a little bit more shortly. Thank you. I don't have to do anything, right, Vanessa? You're no, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> I, will, I will keep it up just while I can see how many people are, are answering. And then Thank when, you. when most people have answered, I will uh, end it and I'll share the results. Great. Well, we'll uh, leave another minute. We probably were not going to have a change in the first question, but the second question, we're going to offer it again at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, about 60% of people have completed the poll, but I'll close it now for um, in, in the interest of time and just share the results. Okay, so it looks like we have um, a few people that have actually reviewed quite a lot. So you all teach us <laughs> and uh, um, others that have uh, completed one to five reviews. Um, and then for the second question, it seems like there is um, quite a bit of confidence actually in identifying bias in peer review. So um, this is great. Uh, thank you for participating and hopefully we'll be um, maybe a little bit more confident or maybe more confused at the end of this workshop. So thank you. Okay, oops, not with the other, oops, stop sharing. Okay. Um, okay, so here um, we would like to begin by inviting you to look at these 10 images. Uh, so these are just images that we took from uh, public, uh, publicly available images on the internet. And when we use this at the beginning of this workshop, it's kind of an icebreaker. Um, we usually go into breakouts, but we don't have time today. So what we would like you to do is just observe these images and put in the chat the number of the image that most um, resonates with you when you think about peer review. And it could be like 
what the, the current peer review system makes you feel through the image or what you wish uh, peer review to be like. Either, either one works. And if you want, you can add to the chat with a number Y that um, is uh, the image that you pick. So we're just going to spend three, four minutes here and I am going to open the chat. So it seems like someone put one, which I really like that idea of a plant and a seed. Um, it's just definitely what we want to see here today. Um, I don't know if that's what you, the top one was, but um, six is, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, and please unmute uh, if someone wants to just vocalize um, their, their choice. Uh, We're also happy to hear from you. We have two votes for numbers. Oh, please go ahead. I can see. I realized that uh, we did good cop, bad cop with the engagement. So I was very <laughs> harsh and you were very like, it's okay. But so do we want to maybe ask people to explain their reason or? Oh, yeah. if they want to. Yeah, please feel free uh, to unmute. This is a, this is our icebreaker. So. This is a, a, a meeting for that reason. We do like people to, but we also don't like to force people to engage. There's two number six. Um, does anyone who put six on the chat want to say why they picked that one? It's like a building something together. I mean, to me, that gives me that hope of collaboration. Um, but I have to tell you my personal pick um, was number eight. Oh, here you go. I just got a whole bunch. I guess like takes time to write. Uh, thank you. So I said six because I think it's very collaborative in terms of building and rebuilding and breaking down. I do like that idea. And that's true that you can just take down and rebuild. Um, and uh, also six is logical. The author finished the manuscript and passed to the reviewer to check it further. Or I guess that, that kind of action of passing down the um, uh, the brick. And then there is a seven. Um, I guess that's a, like a more idea of perhaps um, collaboration that is more aspirational sometimes. Um, and Vanessa said four. I don't know, Vanessa, if you want to say why. I've kind of said why in, in the chat, but like um, yeah, yeah. as we'll be talking about a little bit later, but uh, the idea of, of just stopping and pausing and thinking how you can mm -hmm. best improve someone else's work and best provide feedback for them so that they can progress on onwards, upwards and uh, improve their work. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. It's that stop, think, act mentality, mm -hmm. how to ponder the results. I think we had a comment here as well, someone saying that, I, I think, is there a risk in collaboration? So that's quite interesting. I don't know if someone wants to... Well, it was probably uh, written in when, when we said something, and I just don't know when, uh, but there is a risk in that. There is collaboration, if that person wants to elaborate, and also there is idea of trust in it. Someone would like to elaborate on what object we're talking about. <laughs> But we're gonna have more more opportunities to uh to talk further. So um if nobody else um would like to um share, we're just gonna move into the context. Thank you. Okay. I don't always see the chat, so uh please Vanessa, do interrupt me. Of course, yeah. Uh, okay, so it is a peer review workshop. We don't have a lot of time uh, to, to to just really walk through the whole peer review process. Also, it seems like you all are already um, very familiar with the process. And here we just wanna, we do like to define things so that we are on the same page. Um, so peer review is defined on Wikipedia, at least um, as the uh, evaluation of work by one or more people with similar competence, competence, competencies. Um, as the producers of the work, it functions as a form of self-regulation by quality, qualified members of a profession within the relevant field. And one other reason to share this um, uh, this uh, definition is um, is because we want to, we are pretty of you, we kind of try to challenge that idea of qualified members of a profession. So what does it mean? Uh, who decides who is qualified? who decides who is not qualified, who decides who is an expert and who is not. 
Um, and what does expertise even mean um, in, in this context? And the reason why we like to challenge that is because I think we think that there are many and too many ways that expertise is associated with the wrong things um, in, uh, in the space um, of academia scholarly peer review. And we're going to get into a little more, more into that um, again with an image. We do like images. And this is a cartoon by Nick Kim. This is often used to depict peer review in, uh, in presentations. Um, so here we go. We propose it to you. And as you can see in this cartoon, um, there are, uh, I mean, there's, every time we look at this cartoon, I kind of think about new things that evokes for me. Um, but I would like to open up again, if you would like um, to in the chat or um, if you'd like to unmute. And would you like to share with us what does this image evoke in you when you look at it? Um, what does it make you think about the peer review process? Let me just get the chat open. And if there is a hand up, I should get a notification. So has anyone seen this picture before? It seems a bit daunting and hostile, opposite of what it should be. Definitely hostile, right? It's like a bunch of people with like everyone is armed except for the author, presumably. More subtle obstacles than before. Hmm. So um, definitely in a hostile image, right? We have um, a researcher who is um, supposed to go through this process um, completely unarmed and everybody else has, um, again, like a weapon and there is literally death at the end. Um, some people see it as humiliating. That is definitely not a, a fun thing to go through. Um, and the other things that we kind of notice is also that everybody seems to be kind of similar um, seniority level, um, but you know, of course it's hard to tell it's a cartoon, but definitely similar um, uh, skin tone at least. I don't want to even say ethnicity because it's like, um, but kind of a, a process that is um, uh, scary. And we also see issues with peer review that is like dominated by um, a, very, a kind of a rather homogeneous group of people. So, um, there's a similar seniority, similar background. Thank you. Uh, and there's, this seems not to be diversity. Uh, the mindset, we don't know, can read the minds, but definitely in, in terms of appearance. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And um, another, so here definitely, like there are a lot of, like, of the issues that we try to kind of tackle a pre-review uh, kind of nested in this image. So that's why we like to kind of propose it at the beginning. Um, and another big issue that people find with peer review is that it's a black box. It's like something you just don't know much about what's going to happen. I'm just going to submit this, close my eyes and, and hope that something comes out at the end. Um, and so we, we pre review and what we're trying to do with open peer review is really to kind of um, peel off those layers of opaqueness and, and add transparency to the process and preprint peer review allows us to do that. And um, We'll share a little bit more about that at the end on how we do it. Um, so this is it for like just uh, some some food for thoughts for like what peer review is. Again, not very much, but another important point that we actually want to focus on during this workshop is thinking about what how does this process fit into the larger scheme of researchers' life or life in general. So we. In the title, we have the word like unbiased peer review. And that's not because we really believe that anyone can be unbiased or anything can be unbiased in the world. Uh, but we do like to think about how bias and beliefs and our personal beliefs play, what role they play in peer review. So um, this is what we're going to kind of tackle in the next um, uh, section of this uh, workshop. And again, we do like to start with uh, definitions. So uh, one definition of bias uh, is a disproportionate way in favor of or against an idea or thing, usually in a way that is closed-minded, prejudic prejudicial, or unfair. And so there are many kinds of biases. There are many definitions. Um, this is just, again, a cartoon um, that kind of represents um, a bias that perhaps uh, many of us uh, may have learned uh, in the context of science, which is a uh, selection bias. So, so there is... Um, a speaker asking an audience of statisticians if they are familiar with selection bias, and then conclude from the many hands raised that it is a term most people know. Of course, 
it's a selection bias because we are in a statistics conference where everybody knows about that. But that doesn't mean that everyone knows um, what you know, sem uh, selection sample bias means. So that's one form of bias, but there are many, many shapes and forms and we're not here to define them all. But what we'd like to do here is to try to think, to start pausing, the action of pausing, reflect on what are some of the, the biases that we may be carrying into the peer review process. And you may have heard of implicit bias, um, which is again, an, another layer, right? We just add an adjective to the word bias. And many people talk about, you know, like the biases that we are not aware of. So here defined as a prejudice that turns into an action that is unconscious. So we don't know we have it and we do um, as a result uh, act in a way that we don't know um, that, where it comes from. And it occurs outside of our awareness. And on the other hand, we have the conscious, the explicit bias or conscious bias, which is an action, a prejudice that turns into an action that is conscious. So we are conscious about, we know that we have the bias and we um, we kind of act on it. Um, and the reason why we like to bring this distinction is because many people, especially in the space, like to only think that, you know, the implicit bias is really what, um, you know, what everybody is, it's like, we're not aware of it. So therefore it's just like, it's our fault. And we, first of all, I don't like that mindset, but it's like many times we are aware, we just need to stop and pause and think about where are those biases from. And we don't want to do it from a point of view of shaming. We don't want to just say like, oh, I'm biased. Oh my gosh, where would I go? We're going to just like bring awareness to, to those biases and the beliefs and then figure out how can we counteract them? How can we mitigate the impact of those biases. So really the, the only reason why this distinction is brought up here is because it gives us a way to work on those unconscious biases and bring them to the surface so that we can do something about it. And one of the things that I, it's important is this process of pausing is also to think about the roots. Uh, where, where does that bias, the belief that we have come from? And of course, like I'm spending a month in my home family in my own town and I can see all of some of the, the things, the processes that my brain um, goes through when I think about life that really are ingrained through my childhood that I'm like, oh my God. I, I mean, I look at my mom, it's like, that is like, I do that all the time. And it's just, you know, it makes me like understand the roots of that particular action that I may have. Um, but just in general, like just thinking about where are some of the biases they were most mostly interested in tackling in this process, uh, where do they come from? And it is important to think about where they come from, because if we don't really understand where they come from, we may be resistant to, to solutions or ways to tackle them. Um, so again, it's a short version of open reviewers, but um, one of the, uh, the key things is like some of the biases that are most dangerous um, are rooted in what we define here, or we, no, we don't call them, but they're called system of oppression. And System of oppression are discriminatory institutions, structures, norms, and policies and practices embedded into our society used to oppress groups of people. So examples, and this, the definitions and the words may very different, they may be different in different cultures. Um, this is um, primarily like what the maybe discussions in uh, North American words. I mean, already in my context in Italy, there would be different words, but this is a universal uh, oppressive system of racism, colonialism, patriarchy, ableism, so the um, cisgenderism. So these are just um, words and many ism that are examples of system of oppression that can manifest and do manifest in everything that we do. And so one thing that I'd like to spend a few minutes now is to unpack one of these systems of oppression just in general, again, we're not yet thinking about peer review, uh, but what is a system? So the system of racism, we can think of systemic racism as manifesting within two main categories. Categories, And so we have systemic racism either deals with who we are within ourselves and with each other, or how we build who we are into what we do. So then, when we look at the first category, we find two parts. So there is that personal interpersonal racism. So personal is just the individual, all the individual beliefs and values and thoughts that I may have as a person, as an individual uh, that lead me to um, racist quote unquote actions. 
And interpersonal racism is the expression of racism and these beliefs between individuals. And then this is like what um, our internal values and attitudes. And this is, these are the kind of parts of, of the system that we are thought um, as like the kind of the, the main parts of racism, right? When we think about always oh, a racist person or, and we're less kind of socialized um, or explicitly taught that there are also bigger parts or there are more um, uh, kind of broader parts of the systems. And those are the institutional and structural racism. And so these deal with how we build who we are as people into what we do and the structures that we live in. So institutional racism and uh, discriminatory treatment policies and practices within organizations, um, and then structural goes even a layer above. So it's just uh, the societal, historical, cumulative. So all the um, uh, baggage of history and colonialism that we still have, all the inheritance of our past. And those are baked into big institutions and structures. So we can dub into, so this is, when we talk about system, we're referring to maybe be referring to these four components and the ways that these components interact and overlap and are codependent. I don't know why I can't. And we can dub in any systems in, in this kind of scheme. And just what this helps me, and this was something that Dr. Antoine Foster brought to, to us when she worked with us, is really like a way to kind of compartmentalize, like, or just to describe this complex system and think about where do I have the power to act on interrupting the system. And so system oppressions are everywhere. One of the biggest lie that I have to unlearn as a scientist is that science is just this pure, unbiased space where, oh, I don't like politics. I didn't, I didn't do humanities because it's just like all subjective, but I just like science because it's quantitative and I don't have to, you know, it's not opinionated, but that's a lie, right? Science is made of people. And in fact, science has contributed to legitimizing some of the most horrible uh, theories that have led to the destruction of groups of people to continues to do so. Um, and so like the idea that science and peer review even are immune to um, beliefs or personal individual all the way to the levels of, of structural um, uh, oppression is, is a lie. And we need to face that so that we can begin to uh, counteract the uh, impact of that. And so what we're gonna do now um, is that we're gonna move into our Google Doc and take a look at write ex writing exercise one. Again, this is gonna be um, time for you to, um, if you do have access to it, um, to write in a way that is anonymous. Nobody is can track who you are on the Google Doc, uh, but you're also welcome to share in the chat if the Google Doc is not available to you. And we're gonna take five to 10 minutes of sign and writing. And we are not gonna do breakout rooms. So this is just, the notes and maybe would it be helpful for me to share? Let me see, I just see that. The document was shared. Um, if I go and share, maybe I can, I'm sorry. What happens if I, I have to stop sharing, sorry. I will share again in a second. Um, let me see. So I'm not sure what I'm sharing right now. Um, it's still it's still okay. yours. Is it the, the document? Yeah, we can see the document. Yeah, yeah great. That's the link it. sharing document. Oh, well, that's not the right document. <laughs> that's not. Okay, so we are in this document, and the writing exercise time um, uh, exercise is on page two. So if you scroll down, as you see, there is an anonymous chameleon um, and a lot of beautiful anonymous animals in there, and so there are some prompts prompts here. Um, and we would like you to spend some, some time uh, answering them. Nobody is checking language, grammar, just like try, jot down some thoughts. And um, then if you'd like to share with everyone, we can have uh, a small, a short discussion before um, the break. So I'm just gonna pause here and uh, let everybody work on this. I'll stop sharing um, or actually better. I'm just gonna go back to here. So, um, Take a few minutes there.
There is a question in the chat. Uh, Muhammad Ahmed is asking where will we post answers? So oh, thank you. Sorry. I, yes. So um, here uh, there are people writing. So if you can see, this is a collaborative uh, writing document and you can add, um, you can edit it and you can add your answers um, directly to those bullet points. So the first question here on my lighting, generally without sharing identifying details, have you experienced a witness bias uh, and oppression scholar research and publication? Um, I'm gonna put this this question in the chat as well because if you you may not actually have access to the document, so you can also post your answer in the chat, but that will be identifying who you are. So that's why we provide this Google Doc um, to also allow for people to share without having to identify who they are. I also did notice someone highlight the question, and I um. I jumped to the conclusion that they maybe are highlighting it to answer it on a Word doc and then put their question back. So maybe that's a good thing as well for if you feel shy yeah. typing, you know, your draft question, you can always like type it up on a different document and then copy it and paste it yeah. back. In. Oh. Yeah. But also nobody will know who you are. So you can just write X, Y, Z, anybody will know. <laughs> but yes, it is definitely. I just say that because I felt it where I like started. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, oh, people are watching me. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, it's, uh, even when it's anonymous, you're still. That's cute. true. That's true. So a, a couple more minutes and then um, I can read some of these aloud. Um, or you all feel free to read other people's comments and you can plus one if you feel like you share that. Um, it's just a moment for reflection, so I'm going to move away from sharing that. That could be also weird. I'll go back to it in a minute. Oh, the link again. Yes. Here is the people docs, a long link, but there's a bit link too, and it's a little better. But the link is right here. And if there is anyone who would like to also to share, um, that would definitely identify you. So, but um, hopefully, if if there is if there's something you would like to share with uh, with us um, of your answers or something else that kind of came up during this discussion, um, we welcome hands up as well. I don't see any hands up. I'm just going to read a couple of this just to, because uh, I'm also curious. Um, I mean, curious. I like I like learning from you all. So um, generally, without sharing identifying details, have you experienced a witness bias and oppression as part of research and publication? And um, some have said, uh, if the author has a name, uh, there is a better chance to be published. Um, that is basically what we're, we're going to have, actually. That is one of the most reported bias that people have experienced, which is knowledgeability or how someone is fame, I guess, um, in science or scholarship. Um, the ways that we define scientific knowledge often come uh, from very Western understanding of knowledge. I, this is something I have been trying to learn more and more. Uh, recently, indigenous knowledge models and practices um, are viewed as less or unscientific, definitely rooted in history and colonialism. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And for non-native speakers of English, it can be an issue um, to get past papers and review uh, some language um, with some do some language inadequacies. I totally familiar. I I know that one, um, and we're gonna talk more about that in the second half. Mocking English of the researchers uh, by employing colonial undertones. Wow, yes, <laughs> colonialism is definitely um, a root of a lot of a lot of evil. Um, and then the second question was like ethical responsibilities do review what ethical responsibilities do reviewers, authors, and journal editors have in addressing system like systemic oppression in peer review? How can we hold ourselves and individuals and institutions accountable? This is a, a, this is a big question. So thank you for those of you that they were tried and answering this. 
but uh, encourage journals to adopt diversity and inclusion policies in the editorial and peer review processes. Definitely 70 something percent of the editorial groups are male from North America or Europe and senior in their career. So diversity would be a good first step there, um, but there are definitely much, much more that can be done. Routinely assess the editorial process for biases. Try to be as objective as possible and have an open mind to new ideas. I like the open mind. Uh, consciously involving diverse mindsets and backgrounds into the decisions or conclusions you take, essentially sending you your peer review through uh, its own peer review. Yes, and that's uh, what we're going to try to to go through in the in the second half of the process we can do, because as we individual, we have power to do things. And so that's where we can act first and then actively seek our submissions from underrepresented groups being transparent about their efforts to address systemic oppression. Uh, thank you so much for engaging in this activity. I'm going to go back here. If there is any more that you would like to share, that document remains open. We're gonna use it a little bit more in the second half. And now is our uh, five minute break where anyone is uh, uh, invited to um, go and stretch for five minutes and we'll be back at the 56 minute of the hour, uh, which would be 9.56 for me. Um, whatever hour you're at, the 60, 56 minutes. So five minutes, see you in a bit.
Hey, welcome back, everybody. If you could give me a bit of a thumbs up to show that you're back, that would be great. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to move on to the second half. Um, I can see a hand raised, but I think that might just be to show that you're back. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to unmute. Um, or type the question into the chat. Um, so in our second half today, we're going to be looking more at how to write a manuscript review in a clear, constructive, and actionable way. So we are well aware that writing a manuscript review for the first time can be quite challenging, um, or even uh, looking to, to gain a new perspective if you're very familiar with writing manuscript reviews. Um, it can also be quite a time consuming process to do, especially to do it in a way that is objective, constructive, and in a way that's really truly going to help an author improve their work. So we have put together the reviewer guide. Here it provides six steps um, to providing a, um, a clear, constructive and actionable review. It contains editor's tips, it has content in the PLOS Peer Review Center, and it also offers space to keep notes and keep track of progress. Um, it's openly available via Zenodo, and you can find the DOI link on the slide there. Um, and Danielle is also going to share that into the chat for you as well. You will also have access to these slides afterwards as well, so you can always refer back to them. And the review guide uh, breaks the process down into six steps. So the first step, um, is to check your internal beliefs and assumptions that you may have before even starting the manuscript review. So we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail and work through an activity together. But here we're referring to the beliefs and assumptions that are related to, for instance, uh, gender or the country that the author's institution is located. And some of the things that Daniela was talking about in the first half. Um, and most of us were certainly not taught to do this as part of the review process. Um, and then the other thing that we're going to focus on a little bit more um, is the importance of writing clear and constructive feedback. So outside of this being generally a good practice, it's equally important when we consider the impact that destructive or unprofessional reviews have on researchers, particularly those from marginalized communities. So in the bias reflection guide, um, which we're also gonna share the link to in the chat, um, there is a tool which guides reviewers um, through a non-judgmental thought process of self-reflection to evaluate our own biases and the way in which they may impact how you conduct peer review. So the idea R2 method was developed in collaboration with Dr. Antoinette Foster, and it has four stages. Uh, the first of these is to identify and evaluate a potential bias. Um, then we add to it to make this less covert, to make it more obvious. Reverse this belief to see if there are deviations from it and then rephrase our original statements, adjusting it in response to what we've just learned by going through this full thought process. So the idea is by taking time to pause and think through our biases, we can usually find gaps in knowledge that we may need to research further or simply find that our initial belief that we, we had doesn't actually make sense. So we can update that and mitigate it so it doesn't affect our judgment. So we're gonna look at this um, in action with an example that'll hopefully make it a little bit clearer for you. So looking at this through the lens of an example of a common bias here, we've got in this example that we are reviewing a research manuscript and we recognize that the senior author is someone who is at a late stage in their career. And we then catch ourselves realizing that we hold the belief that because they are at a late stage in their career and we, we recognize this, we think they're likely to have a lot of um, domain expertise. And that knowing this makes me feel more confident in the, in the quality of the proposed research approach. So first let's look, dig a little bit deeper into why we or someone else may hold such a belief. So we can ask ourselves, why do the author's years of experience lead me to believe that the re re results and impact of the research are likely to be more trustworthy? Well, one answer may be that I know that this author is renowned in my field. So I think that they probably do good science. They wouldn't let bad science come from their lab. And therefore I think this work is trustworthy. And to further evaluate the issue, we can then ask ourselves, is this logical? Is there a rationale that supports the notion that experience equals trust in the quality of the work? And we could say that their years of experience and them having gained the respect of the research community may indicate that this study is likely good. 
So on the surface, it does make sense. There is a rationale that supports our, um, our beliefs. We can then add to this um, by adding a, um, an absolute statement. So we can, can we add, is this always true? We can, can we add always guarantee or never into the statement and it still makes sense. So the author is at a late stage of their career and therefore their experience means that their research is always trustworthy, accurate and reliable. So how does this now sit with you? In most cases, making a statement so black and white makes us reflect that perhaps this is not always gonna be the case. And at this point, if it makes sense for the example, it might be useful to reverse the original statement. So in this case, are there situations I can think of in which the experience would not influence the quality of the manuscript? So the senior author may not have had time to revise the work, or this may be an unfamiliar technique, so they don't have experience with how to best analyze the data. And finally, we can now rephrase our original statement, taking into account the reflection we just made. So we might say that, although the author's experience and recognition in the field may correlate with sound and rigorous experiments, data analysis and conclusions, it's not something I can take for granted. There are many factors that could influence a manuscript's need for revision. And I should remember that experience does not necessarily mean that the work is not questionable or that it can be quicker at evaluating the rigor of the work. So it's a way in which to step back, pause and think rather than we, we jump to conclusions or assumptions that we may have in our minds. So we're going to now go into breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to go into two breakout rooms for the uh, number of people that we have here with us today. Um, each group will have a different question, a different example to work through. We're just going to take 10 minutes. So it says 15 on the slides. We've got updated the slides, but I've been sharing them um, before we updated them. So we'll have 10 minutes inside these rooms um, and then we'll come back for a, a quick group discussion afterwards. Please take notes in the shared Google document that we were in earlier. Um, you'll find that there is a section for group one and a section for group two, and you can make notes under each uh, question there. Um, and please nominate a person to report back when we come back to the main room. Um, just to also add that if you have any um, questions or if you need any extra help in a breakout room, there is a box that you can click, you can ask for help and you can invite the host and myself or Daniela will hopefully, uh, will, will pop in and hopefully uh, help you out um, with whatever issue that you're encountering. Um, I would also just like to add that please remember to introduce yourself briefly in whatever way you would like to be known by your group. Please be kind, curious and respectful of other uh, opinions and um, experiences. Please do try to speak for one nth of the time. So this means that, for example, if you're in a room with 10 people, you should be speaking a tenth of the time to make space for others to speak. Please do share one thing at a time and keep your um, keep your opinions clear so that others can understand you easily. And please do offer affirmations, clarifying questions and helpful suggestions. Um, yeah, so I think we can open the rooms now. Uh, Daniela, I think you were going to do that if that's possible. No, I don't want to close. They're open, sorry. <laughs> They're open. Okay, so you should be able to see an invitation to uh, one of your breakout rooms. And you joining is optional, but uh, we uh, invite you to do so. If there is need for us to jump in, please let us know uh, following the instructions that I just went through. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. Does it matter if the breakout rooms are kind of evened out? Because I'm seeing um, no, as long as as long as there's enough people in to have a conversation, it should be fine. Oh, you're saying room one is bigger than room two? It wasn't. I don't know why it's just um I think it's just more people have now joined um, yeah. one. We could maybe ask one of those people to move to room two. So I might ask Femi if they will room to, move to room two. Um, Do you can you can you message them, Vanessa? Um, I can just give them an invitation to go to okay. room. That's Thank fine. You. They've they've moved now. Okay. 
So that's a great. <laughs> and my fault, I took too long as usual. So I eat up on the time for Vanessa. Um, yeah, right. I usually don't start. That's why I'm never the first bit. <laughs> I take too long. <laughs> Um, I mean, we're obviously we do like to try and stay within the time, but it's okay for a little. I know it's, you have to leave quite soon, but we're usually okay with you know an extra ten minutes here or there, an extra five minutes. We sh we shouldn't need that, but yeah, it's just that it's that we shorten the time for the breakout. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll come back from the breakout at uh fifteen. Just yeah, quarter past the hour. I'll send a, a reminder, five minutes left at uh, 10, 10, or whatever, 10 minutes, yeah. Thank you so much, by the way, for the presentation so far. I'm finding it so interesting, and um, I think it's such an important conversation to be having that, honestly, I don't see have enough, like, not enough people I see around talk about biases and these things in a way, because we just hosted in January, we hosted a a, a symposium about decolonizing open science um and it was very interesting and it was you know like uh, we had a lot of engagement we had a lot of people who wanted to be a part of the conversation and it's one of my personal you know like passions is trying to decolonize anything related to knowledge um but the big problem that we had was kind of finding that tangible like what next you know and so i think this is a perfect, or this workshop is a perfect example of what comes next, is how do you take those theoretical abstract conversations and place them into practical, you know, ways to really change the system that we operate in. So thank you so much. I feel like I hope oh, everyone as much. Can, in I, can I please uh, interrupt uh, for a moment? Yeah. Uh, I think room one is uh, silent. There's no communication. I think someone, uh, Gide Abebe, asked for help from that okay. sure. one. yeah um daniel as i'm currently slide showing would you be able to pop into room one well, apologies i don't i didn't see the help <laughs> no me neither okay is that room one yeah it's in room one okay it's very nice and active though i can see the microphones going mm -hmm. yeah, yeah room two is quite interactive mm, yeah i can see room one they're all on mute Hello, if you've just joined, we are just currently in breakout rooms for the next five minutes, and then we'll be coming back to the main room. Um, if you would like to join a breakout room, please let us know in the chat, and I'd be happy to send you an invitation. Um, and that goes for anybody. If anyone would like to join a breakout room right now and you haven't, um, please let us know in the chat, and we'll happily resend you an invite.
Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Would it be all right if I took a screenshot of the document that we were all writing on anonymously and put it on our social media? Or do you think that would be Yes, that's absolutely fine. You can, yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much. Oh, we have another person joining us as well. Hello, if you've just joined, uh, we're currently in breakout rooms for the next three minutes um, and then we'll, everyone will be back in the main room. Um, so please just bear with us while we finish off this breakout activity. Um, at this point, it probably doesn't make sense to just uh, join the conversation, but we are in a, a shared Google Doc, um, which we can put the link to in the chat once more. Um, we're we're looking currently at writing exercise number two, um, where we're going through the IDRT method. So I'll just put the link into the chat once more for anyone who's just joined, um, but we won't add you to a breakout room at this point. We'll be coming back to the main room in two minutes time. I just closed all rooms, so one minute. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I was about to do the same thing. Okay, I think we should all be back now, Eve. Um, so I hope you had some interesting conversations in your breakout rooms. Um, before we continue on, I would like to ask if anyone would like to share out loud to the group um, any highlights from your conversations. Um, so from, would anyone from group one uh, like to share what, a bit about their discussion? So group one was looking at um, the country in which the author's research institute is located makes me feel confident in the accuracy and reliability of the study. And would anyone from group one like to share any um, highlights from that conversation? This is optional, so you don't have to. I think group one was maybe a bit quieter anyway. Um, so maybe we'll ask uh, if anyone from group two would like to share anything about um, your conversation. I see that there's still people who are writing into the notes and that's absolutely fine as well. You can continue making notes. Um, but group two, we're looking at the writing style and the manuscript feels clumsy. The researcher's primary language is probably not English. And this makes me feel less confident in the quality and accuracy of the research. And I'm well aware that most people in this audience are uh, languages, first language is not English, um, so I, I do wonder if there's any interesting insights from your group discussions.
anyone from group two like to share? You can also put um, share in the uh, chat as well if you would rather not speak out loud. Okay, well, in the interest of time, what I will say then is please do take a look in the shared Google document at what others have written in the other groups. And um, please do add your own thoughts. You can always plus one things that you agree with. Um, so please do take uh, some time to have a look at what the others have put in the other breakout rooms. Um, and I will continue on with the rest of the presentation for today. Um, so, I'm going to go through some of the other steps from the reviewer guide. Um, so moving on to step two, so gain a, con a conceptual understanding. So it may seem obvious, but what we recommend is that on your first read through the whole man manuscript, focus on understanding what the research is about, the hypothesis, the main question, the proposed approach, the initial claims and conclusions. Note what you're unfamiliar with, any questions that you may have so that you can come back to them later. So I'm curious to know how many of you actually intentionally do something like this before you start to evaluate a research manuscript. It's quite a lot of people who had uh, quite a lot of experience in peer review, if I remember correctly from the poll at the beginning. Um, so please put a thumbs up emoji if it's something that you, you tend to do when you first read a manuscript. But it comes up from Daniela, but maybe maybe this is something that people don't necessarily take the time to just pause and do. So the goal during this step is to not necessarily look for flaws, but to just understand the content um, as a whole before digging into it any deeper. Um, moving on to step three, this is where we evaluate, appreciate, and raise concerns. Um, so on your second read through, you can begin identifying positive aspects of the research as well as any concerns that you may have about the project goals, the research question, approach, methods, results, how the data is visualized, etc. You can highlight them, you can write them down to help you organize your notes later. Um, and so the goal here is to also um, highlight any positive aspects and not just nitpicking and, and looking for things that are wrong, but also things that we can praise and that, that will work well in the research as well. And at this point, it may be useful to then um, uh, categorize your concerns into major concerns or minor concerns. Um, and sometimes these are also uh, written down as core concerns or peripheral concerns. So major concerns tend to be those that the authors need to address before the manuscript is recommended for journal publication. So these are concerns that if they are left unaddressed, they could compromise the interpretation of the study. Whereas minor concerns are those that the authors should consider addressing to improve readability and general comprehension. But if they're left unaddressed, they would not necessarily in, uh, affect interpretation of the study. And as with every categorization, these are not perfect. Uh, they're not objective. However, just thinking about your concerns under this kind of lens can help you structure your review and can help the editor uh, and the author understand what are the concerns that you think are the most critical and the most uh, that they need the most attention to be revised. So some examples um, of major concerns, and these are not um, all of them, obviously, these are just examples, might be things like unethical approach to research question, uh, conclusions that are not supported by the data, contradictory conclusions, not accounting for or appropriate discussion of study limitations or any confounding variables that can affect the results or issues with experimental design, um, such as insufficient sample size or data, improper controls, inappropriate methodology or statistical analyses. And examples of concerns that are more minor are things such as technical clarifications, um, how the data is presented or visualized, typo, spelling, grammar, and phrasing issues. You see we've got a star that will come back to that in a second, or perhaps missing or wrong references and citations. So the reason we've got a star there for the, the typos is that while it's tempting to focus on grammatical errors, as people may have been talking about in breakout room two, when it came to the language example, um, sentence structure and, and choice of words, things like this, um, they don't necessarily equal poor research. So please remember that you're, you're not a copy editor. Um, it, it can be distracting if you feel that the language is, is not correct, but this doesn't always mean that the, the research itself is of poor quality. 
Um, so it's import particularly important to keep this in mind when you're reviewing a manuscript who, which is authored by researchers who, where English is not their first language, um, as interpreting language mistakes um, as a lack of overall quality can constitute as a common bias amongst reviewers, which is why we looked at that example earlier. Moving on to step four now. Um, so on your rec uh, second read through, you begin to identify and take notes of concerns uh, that you may have. Um, but it should not be just a list of things that you believe is wrong with a manuscript. So for each one, as much as possible, uh, you should try to make sure that you um, that your feedback is as uh, clear as possible so it can be interpreted correctly, constructive, so that it's more likely to be well received, and actionable, so that it's more likely to be integrated and useful for the author. So importantly, constructive doesn't necessarily mean positive, so it should be as critical as we need to be, but in a way that the reader understands why and is best positioned to address the concern. And actionable doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be able to provide the right answer yourself. The action could also be that the researchers need to consult with experts in a particular field, and that expert doesn't necessarily need to be you. And here we're going to look at a very uh, quick example of how we might rephrase some um, unconstructive feedback to make it more useful for the author. So this is a, a real example um, here of, of a, a piece of destructive, non-actionable feedback. So here the comment was that the authors should go back to Statistics 101. So needless to say, this feedback is destructive. It's insulting. Um, it's also quite lazy. It's not very clear or actionable. It doesn't give the authors anything that they can do to improve their work. Um, so it's it's really not useful. Um, and here's an example of how this could be rewritten in a more clear, constructive and actionable manner. Um, and here I'm gonna also highlight it in these sorts of ways as well. So we tend to say that it's useful to think of it in terms of interpretation, reason, recommendation and depersonalization. So I won't read through all of this um, out loud, but you can you can read this yourself as well. But you can see that the de depersonalized way of doing it is to refer to the test and the choices that the researchers have made rather than the researchers themselves. The inter interpretation is that you know the you know the, the data presented in this manuscript appears to be highly skewed to the left. So this is the, your interpretation of their um, their research reasons. So your reasoning for why you think that this may not be the correct way of doing it, or that there might be a better way um, of doing this, and recommendations. So uh, ending with uh, recommending things that they could do to improve this work. So explicitly mentioning in the methods section, justifying your uh, choice accordingly, or suggesting the use of a different type of test. So just another comment here on um, and constructive and unprofessional feedback is that it's not only useless to the receiver, but it can also be harmful. And that harm can even be larger for individuals belonging to traditionally marginalized communities. So a group of researchers uh, conducted an inter international study of ta um, targeting researchers in the fields of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and maths, aimed at investigating um, the pervasiveness of author perceptions of long-term implications of receiving unprofessional peer reviews. And these were the types of comments that people reported receiving. So this paper is simply manual, what the author's done as an insult to science, or even more personal attacks, such as the author's status as a trans person has distorted um, his view of sex beyond the biological, biological reality, or the author's last name sounds Spanish. I didn't read the manuscript because I'm sure it's full of bad English. So I'm sure that these uh, comments are probably quite shocking to you to read, but these are actually um, true examples of um, feedback that researchers have received. And the authors of the study found that traditionally underrepresented groups in STEM were most likely to perceive negative impacts on their scientific aptitude and career advancement after receiving an unprofessional review. So it shows that not only is this feedback a reality of, in the space of scholarly evaluation, but also how it underscores the importance of providing feedback that's useful for um, not only for the advancement of science, but also for people um, um, in, in advancement of their own careers, so they're not disproportionately harmed um, in, in career pro progression as well by these types of comments. Okay, moving on to our final couple of steps now. So in step five, we then pull all of 
everything we've done so far up until this point into a coherent narrative. So in this step, we think about combining everything that will make our final review. So although there is not one universal um, type of review format, it's useful to keep one in mind to help guide the writing. So you might think of structuring your review in quite a basic way like this, kind of like an inverted pyramid type shape where the most important information is at the top. So here you'd have the summary of the research and your overall impressions and your overall uh, overview um, and what your recommendation uh, of a course of action is, followed by details and examples in the center and any additional points and miscellaneous remarks at the end. And then finally, in step six, check your review before you share it. So thinking about step one, the beliefs and assumptions that you identified in yourself. How did you feel that you did in your review? Did you manage to keep those in mind and mitigate how they might have affected your judgment? Thinking about step three, does your review highlight the strengths as well as the weaknesses of the study? And in step four, does your feedback sound as constructive, clear and actionable as it possibly can be? And then finally, does your review read well from the summary to the end? So often it's good to take a high level lens to this and read it from the perspective of the reader or the author, not just as yourself as a reviewer. So how would you feel upon receiving your review? Um, would you feel like you had ways in which to go to improve your research and know clearly what the review is saying? So here we were gonna do a brief demo. I don't think it's showing the embedded video on my, I don't know if you can see that. Um, but we have a video here that is a publication demo. So if you would like to know how to use the preview platform, we will send these slides around on this uh, video will be embedded in. I think Daniela will also share the link perhaps in the chat. Oh no, Daniela's had to leave. So I will go and share, find the link for you in the in my document. Give me one second. Um, I'll just pop this into the chat for you. Um, so you'll be able to see a demo of the preview platform. And as Daniela talked about before, at Preview, we provide a platform for anyone, uh, with, as long as you have an ORCID identifier, to be able to come along and review preprints. Um, so you can uh, practice reviewing, you can build a profile as a reviewer. It's also linked to your ORCID profile, so any of your review activity will then be listed on your ORCID profile so that you can get some recognition and credit as well for the peer review work that you do. Um, so we also welcome you to check that out. Um, and these are some of the things that you can do next uh, after today. So please do feel free to come along to pre-review and uh, make an account, fill in your profile, tell us your research interests, uh, start reviewing so you can copy and paste it in DOIs of um, preprints that you would like to review. And then you can review them in whichever way that you like. So you can use a basic template, you can copy and paste in your review. We have a structured review that gives you some prompts to guide you through some questions. Um, to start thinking about things more carefully, if you would like to do it that way. We have Open Reviewers Training, which is a, a more expanded version of what we've just done today. Uh, we have some pre-reviewed clubs. If you would like to review together as a collaborative group, we can uh, create you one for free on our platform. And you can always speak to us about other events, such as live reviews, where we get people together to review a paper together, or other training workshops as well. And always you can join our, our conversation on the Slack community. I'm going to put the um, QR codes to joining our Slack community and our newsletter if you'd like to hear more about us up on the screen. So just before we go, I've got the final poll to launch as well. Um, so I'm just going to pop that onto the screen right now so you should be able to see. So this is the same question as earlier. I'm kind of hoping that maybe you might feel a little bit uh, more confident in identifying bias. It might have gone the other way. You might feel like now that we've talked about this, you might feel a little bit less confident, uh, and that's also fine. This is also just an introductory workshop for you to, to go away and hopefully think about these things more. 